This is a very special moment for me uh, <clears throat> to be with you. I have one really big thing in common with most of you here tonight. It's not age, but I'm single. And I always thought I knew why I was single. But I learned later in life that I didn't know. And when I was at Fried Hardeman, uh, my roommate and I drove to a little church in northern Alabama, the Hendricks Chapel Church. And I preached and he led singing. And it was, a, it was a wonderful experience, and we left, and a year or two later, I went back and did a meeting. And then, uh, maybe 10 or 15 years later, I was back in Florence, and a group that I had known decided to have a little reception for me, and we could have a reunion and all get together. And when we were going to Hendricks Chapel as college students, there were two girls, two cousins, who were part of that little congregation. And one of the, the two were there that night, and one of them asked if she could have a private moment with me. And I said, yes. And she said, you know, I've carried this burden through the years, and I, I, I need to tell you about it. She said, when you and Lee were coming to Hendricks Chapel, my cousin and I, she had a crush on Lee, and I had a crush on you. But you were college guys, and you didn't notice. And then she said you left, and then I heard you were coming back, and I started praying. I prayed, dear Lord, please let Landon notice me when he comes back. And she imagined a romantic relationship and a long life together. But she said, you came back and left and didn't notice. And then I prayed, Lord, if I can't have him, don't let anyone else. <laughs> now, anyone here who doubts prayer. <laughs> if I had any gift tonight, any special gift, it would be this. I would like to have the gift of being able to look at each one of you and know you. To know your name, to know your parents, to know where you grew up, to know, to know something about your friends, something about your experience in school, something about your fears, your doubts, and your hopes and dreams. Because if I knew that, then we could sit in a much more personal and maybe meaningful moment. I've looked a lot at research about your age group, and I've traveled the country over the last few years meeting with small groups of young adults about your age, some a little older. In long evenings to listen and to hear what's going on, because so many in your age group who have grown up going to church have dropped out and are going no longer. And so I was very interested in who they were and what was happening. And when I think about that, I, I, I see over and over that there's not any way in the world to take a general view of your age group and believe that that is who you are. Because even though you're a part of an age group, as I'm a part of an age group, the characteristics of that age group are general, and they really don't get down to who I really am, and what my fears are, and what my hopes are, and what my dreads are, and what my concerns are about my life, 
That's personal. And it's not easy to be personal. It's, it's, it's not difficult to wallow a bit sometimes, even in our own questions and feeling sorry for ourselves and all of that. But it's something else to, 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 to be a person, and you're born into a world at one of the rare times of all of human history. You're in a hinge part of the world in which there's a kind of change that's going on right now that's going to affect the next hundreds of years. And you feel a lot of that. We feel it in the tremendous upset in the Middle East, the violence that, that is there, and all the religious questions that get mixed into that. And you see it in the tremendous explosion of knowledge and technology where the knowledge of the world is at your fingertips with what you have before you that you can Google any question and get an answer. And your world is a world in which we are looking at each other sexually in ways that we haven't in ages past. And it's raised a lot of new questions and different questions about that. We're living in a world in which, instead of going abroad to see the foreigners, those who have been in foreign lands are now next door neighbors, and their children play with our children. So it's, it's, it's a different kind of world. Now, in such a world where you're attempting to decide, how do I live in this world? Not yesterday's world, not tomorrow's world, but how do I live in my world? What's important? Paul prayed in Philippians 1 that they would abound in, the, in love, that their love would abound in knowledge and in insight, so that you might know what is best, so that you might know what really matters, and then present yourself pure and blameless at the judgment. And so what matters to you? And I think there are two things that matter. One is you, because you're all you have. Your life comes into this world different from any life that has ever been, and no life that ever comes this way will ever be like your life, and your life comes with one command. And that command is to fulfill your life. If you do not do it, it will never be done. No one else can do it. And so the command that each one of us faces is to look at ourselves and to know who we are. And then the second thing that is most important is others. And when you think about that, and the more you think about it, on the first day of life, on the last day of life, it will be, how have you lived? Have, have you, my own father, in his age, a year or two before he died, said, Landon, I don't know if I've done anything of significance in my life. You hear that over and over with those who are reaching the end. And so the two things that really matter are you and then others, your relationship to others. Now all of life comes down to that, and life that fails in those two area, areas really fails in the fundamental command to be yourself and to fulfill yourself. And those have been the two questions that have informed my own life. I've worked, as some of you may know, for the last 40 plus years outside religious walls. I've worked not centrally. I preached in the 60s, and from the late 60s on, then my work was in the midst of the world and not inside religious walls. And the two questions that 
inform me early were, what does it mean to be a person? And the second was, what does it mean to be with others? Now, where do we go for instruction? And how do we decide, how can I fulfill my life? How can I be with others in a world such as ours today? And that's where I'd like for us to enter again the book of Luke. And I'll just tell you sort of my story. Because one of the problems with Scripture is we learn it and we learn it and we read it and we read it. But somehow we can read it all of our lives and it never grips us. It never grips us at the deepest level of the two most important questions, and that is who you are and what does it mean to be with another human being. And Paul points out you can have all knowledge, but if it doesn't come down to love, if it doesn't come down to how you love yourself and how you love another, then he said it all amounts to zero And we can look all over the place at what is happening with religion and all the questions of faith and all the the questions of doubt and all the struggles that the church has, but I promise you it all comes down to whether we know ourselves and know how to be with another human being. If we don't know how to do that and we don't learn that and if our faith doesn't teach us that and if Scripture doesn't teach us that, then it's all zero. And you will apt to be another dropout. Some of you in this room will apt to leave. No longer you were reared in church. You went two or three times a week. But some of you, unless you grasp who you are and who another individual is and learn to get into the text, learn to get into Scripture with those two basic things hanging on to them for dear life, then the future may be bleak. And when you look into the material, the world into which Luke tells the story of Jesus, it too was a hinge moment in human history. In many ways like our world, something was dying that would not return. And something was being born that was not yet clear. And Jesus stood between those two worlds. And what did he do? What did he do? What he did may contain some information for what I should do. When I entered the book of Luke years ago, And I kept seeing all of these stories with this person and that person, and we've been recounting those stories here. And I learned the stories. I I learned them and could quote some of those stories, but that wasn't what nagged me. I told the stories, I preached the stories, But there was something else that nagged me, and that was how in the world, if you had a worldwide dream, why in the world would you not spend your time analyzing the times, giving speeches on the times, trying to understand all of this and that about culture? Why wouldn't you take on the great issues of the world and focus there and become world famous for understanding the world, understanding the trends of the world. But Jesus didn't do that. Nor did Jesus go inside a religion that had become quite sick in many ways. But he didn't go in there and try to bring the change, which is what sometimes I was asked to do and sometimes wanted to do. If we could just get inside this this religious institution, and if we could just 
Get people's eyes open, our own beginning with our own. And if we could just, if we could just change this, if we could just, if we could just get the church right. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus went and must have thought that the way to live in this world is, first of all, to know who I am. And so there are 30 silent years in Jesus' life. What was he doing? What was he thinking? What was behind the scenes? What broke his heart? What relationships did he struggle with? And how many lonely nights did he spend wondering who he was and how to be in the world? I enter those silent years partly through my own experience. My own life has been marked by suffering and has been marked by a loneliness that I could never describe. Not just suffering and loneliness from not having someone next to me, but a suffering and loneliness that goes to this human story that goes to life that goes to the mystery of this person and the suffering of another person. The silent years. The years that you spend by yourself in the inner sanctum of your own heart, wondering who you are and what you should be. Those are precious experiences and you have time to work that out. Jesus was 30. Luke tells us when he launches his ministry. Be gentle with yourself. And then when he launches his ministry, here, here are all these stories. There's a leper. And there's a Samaritan woman. And there's this dead child and here's a blind person, and one that's deaf. Here's a diseased individual. Here's one that's lost the mind. And why did Jesus do that? I'm not, the thing that changed my life in Luke was not that Jesus did it but it was why did he do it? And that was the question that seized my own heart. Because when people told the story of Jesus, they said, let me tell you about the time that he met this leper. Let me tell you about the time that he met this adulterous woman. Let me tell you about the time when there was this child. Let me tell you about the time. And what grabbed and ceased and penetrated my own heart was who is the leper in my life? Oh, I'm going to be a disciple. I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus. I preach discipleship. I taught discipleship. One can do all of that with Scripture, but once we enter into Luke and ask why why did Jesus do it this way? And who is the Samaritan woman in my life? It doesn't make any difference how many were in Jesus' life now. It's how many is in your life. How many lepers are in your life, metaphorically speaking? Is there an adulterous woman in your life? 
You say, I want to be a disciple. We say we want to follow Jesus Christ. But how can we follow Jesus Christ if we live all of our lives and there's never an adulterous woman in our life that other people say, let me tell you what happened there. What we're trying to look at is the difference between knowing biblical knowledge and somehow allowing that knowledge to come in and grip our hearts and move us at the depths of our souls and change us so that our countenance is different and so that our words are different and so that our actions are different. Until you get your own life inside the book of Luke, you probably will not know transformation. You probably will not know change. And so here is the Master giving us some insight into what discipleship is, and he focuses on the most important thing in the world, on who Jesus was and how to be with another human being. So that's one way that I have entered the book of Luke. It's not just to look at the material, but to try to find myself in the material. To find myself with and beside Jesus in terms of transformation. But there's a second way that I enter the world, enter Luke. All of you who have read the book are familiar with the story of temptation. I read the temptation, I preached sermons on the temptation. But then one day, after I had traveled through 80 countries of the world in 69 and 70, and had traveled to the outback of many of those countries and had tried to speak words of life in most of those countries, but then I was re-entering the United States and stopped in Hawaii. And I was pretty emaciated, weighed no more than 110 or 20 pounds. And I was exhausted. And I went to Hilo and checked into a motel. And it was raining nonstop, a, a monsoon type rain that just beat on the little place where I was staying. And for three days and three nights, I was with this story of the temptation of Jesus. And in those three days, and what I, what I want to say first of all here, is when we read an account like this, we need to get inside that, that isn't there simply for your head. It's there for your life. It's there for your work. And part of what seized me in that moment was Jesus is at the beginning of his ministry. He has a kingdom that is designed to be the kingdom of Lord of lords and King of kings. That's designed to be for every, every person under heaven, for every culture, for every language under heaven. It's a worldwide dream that he has. Now what's going to motivate him? What motivates you? What drives you? Why do we do the things that we do? 
And so Satan appears to, to Jesus, and it's almost as if he says, Jesus, you have a wonderful dream. And I can, I can see the excitement in your face, but how are you going to do it? And he begins to tempt Jesus. And he says, you're going to need wealth, and so turn the stones to bread. It's going to take a lot of money, Jesus, a lot of wealth. And here's the way to do that. And Jesus said no. And then he comes back and says, you know, aren't you going to need power? You need to be able to move the levers of power in the world. And so I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you the nations of the world. And, and you can get your dream done that way. And Jesus said no. And then he said, well, you need to be known. And, and, and think of ways that you can be famous. Maybe like jumping off the temple. Announce it everywhere that you're going to do that. People will be so impressed. And Jesus said no. Now, those temptations can be dealt with at a scripture level. But it's something else when those temptations really come home in our lives. They're devastating. And we think, oh, I wouldn't make those mistakes, but we make them over and over and over again. And so Luke tells us that when Jesus left, what do you remember the line? He returned in the power of the Spirit. When we're figuring out what we're going to do and how we're going to serve and how discipleship is going to be a part of our lives, spend a lot of time with the story of the temptations of Jesus. Those, my understanding of that temptation, have shaped every major decisions I've made in my life and work. Over and over, they have formed the no to certain offers and to certain temptations. I don't know if I've always done those correctly, but I do know that instead of that just being a passage of Scripture and an event in the life of Jesus, that it became totally central to my own choices and decisions for my personal life and for my work. Uh, this is a little bit introductory to what we'll go on and do tomorrow, but let me just close tonight with what I think is the greatest gift and the greatest accomplishment of Jesus. And I hear this carefully. I don't think it was the birth, however that happened, I don't think it was walking on water. I don't think it was raising a dead person. And I don't think it was his resurrection. I think the greatest gift that Jesus gave was the gift of his presence to another human being. Now, all those other things go into the building of that present presence. And I think in coming away from the book of Luke, it would be good for each of us to ask, am I present with 
another human being in the manner in which Jesus was present so that transformation comes to a life. I think the future of faith probably rests there. Let's pray. Dear God, how can we get past our religious oddities? How can we get past our pretensions? How can we get past the guises that sometimes as Christians we can wear so that we could be with another person so fully present that nothing is ever quite the same. Give each of your children in this room tonight that gift to your honor and to your glory forever and ever. Amen.